I've included this in my book, The Power of Compassion, Seven Ways That You Can Make a Difference. Uh, and that's why I wrote this book, because compassion is often the last thing people resort to when dealing with someone who is emotionally heightened, angry, belligerent, uh, and abusive. It's the last thing we just were into other reacting types of behaviors which keep us in a, a victim modality. Alright, so until we do these things, nothing changes. There was some research done and I, I talked with this young man, uh, William Phelps, and he was a doctoral student at the University of Washington Business School. And uh, he designed an experiment to see what happens when a bad apple worker joins the team. He divided people into small groups and gave them a task. One member of the group would be an actor acting out a bad apple, either like a jerk, a disruptor, or a depressive. Within 45 minutes, the rest of the group started behaving like the bad apple. And so, yes. You know, this is a concern. Uh, we have the people group up and then everybody starts kind of behaving the same way. Yes, it is an issue. But, and so they were going along and it just was, you know, it was time after time. Yep, they were getting the same result. And then, what was particularly surprising was that while the results were consistent from one group study to the next, there was one time when a team member was a particularly good teacher and leader and he would ask questions, engage all the team members, and diffuse conflicts, and really listen to what they had to say. In this one group study, the bad apple had no sustaining impact on the rest. Later, it was discovered that this young man's father was a diplomat. And what he did with the bad apple and the others who had been negatively influenced was engage them, engage them, and connect with them like a diplomat. He had an amazing diplomatic ability to diffuse conflict that would normally emerge as the actor would display this real bad apple type behavior by asking questions and then listen attentively to their answers. And the questions you ask do not start with, why did you do that? Okay, so let me tell you right now in my program it is not about asking why ever again. So the research is in. A leader can, in fact, change the dynamics and performance of a group by simply listening compassionately, asking questions with the intention of engaging fear-based perceptions in order to diffuse the disruption. By going around the group, asking questions, soliciting everyone's opinions, no matter how negative they appear to be, making sure everyone is heard. One person can literally transform the energy and dynamics of a group that is being adversely affected. I have one more uh, compelling research that I want to share with you. Just recently, Wired Magazine came out with an article, The Mental Machine, it was written by the executive director of Wired Magazine, Thomas Getz. And he basically says that our brains and our behavior are driven by feedback loops. He says that if you harness the, their power, you'll change your life. The research that he brought to the table I thought was extremely significant to supporting the program as I'm teaching it. Uh, he said that in uh, 2003, officials in Garden Grove, California, a community of 170,000 people wedged amid the urban sprawl of Orange County, set out to confront a problem that afflicts most every town in America, drivers speeding through school zones. He said that local authorities had tried many tactics to get people to slow down. They replaced old speed limit signs with bright new ones to remind drivers of the 25 mile an hour limit during school hours. Police began ticketing speeding motorists during drop off and pick up times. But these efforts had only limited success 
and speeding cars continue to hit bicyclists and pedestrians in the school zones with depressing regularity. So city engineers decided to take another approach. The five Garden Grove school zones, they put up what are known as dynamic speed displays or driver feedback signs, a speed limit posting coupled with a radar sensor attached to a huge digital readout announcing your speed. The signs were curious in a few ways. For one thing, they didn't tell drivers anything they didn't already know. There is, after all, a speedometer in every car. If a motorist wanted to know their speed, a glance at the clash dashboard would do it. For another thing, the signs used radar, which decades earlier had appeared on American roads as a talisman technology reserved for police officers only. Now, Garden Grove had scattered radar sensors along the side of the road like speed cones, and the Your Speed signs came with no punitive follow-up. No police officer standing by ready to write a ticket. This defines decades of law enforcement dogma which held that most people obey speed limits only if they face some clear negative consequence for exceeding them. In other words, officials in Garden Grove were betting that giving speeders redundant information with no consequence would somehow compel them to do something few of us are inclined to do, and that is to slow down. The results were fascinating, and uh, they delighted the city officials. In the vicinity of the schools where the dynamic displays were installed, drivers slowed an average of 14%. Not only that, at three schools, the average speed dipped below the posted speed limit. Since this experiment, Garden Grove has installed 10 more driver feedback signs. Now that was in 2003. Of course, much has happened around this since then. But the basic premise is simple. Provide people with information about their actions in real time or something close to it, then give them an opportunity to change those actions, pushing them toward better behaviors. Action, information, action. The simplicity of the feedback loop is simple and yet deceptive. They are in fact powerful tools that can help people change bad behavior patterns, even those that seem irretractable. Just as important, they can be used to encourage good habits, turning progress itself into a reward. When we keep coming at the behavior there's no reward. There's no opportunity to do better. A feedback loop involves four distinct stages. First comes the data. A behavior must be measured, captured, and stored. This is the evidence stage. Second, the information must be relayed to the individual, not in a raw data form in which it is captured, but in context that makes it emotionally resonant. This is a relevance stage. But even compelling information is useless if we don't know what to make of it. So we need a third stage, and that is consequences. The information must illuminate one or more paths ahead. And finally, the fourth stage is action. There must be a clear moment when the individual can recalibrate a behavior, make a choice and act. Then that action is measured and the feedback loop can run once again. Every action stimulating new behaviors that inch us closer to our goals. So, one of the things I want to say about this is you see how you're driving, you see the speed limit, you know you're in a school zone, you have an opportunity to correct yourself. Now let's talk about the bully behavior. So we have the bully behavior, we have someone who doesn't like it, we have someone who's interceding, and there's a way to intercede with no judgment 
to make a teachable moment. You come at somebody with a judgment about their unskillful behavior, about their emotionality in this moment, making it wrong or bad, and you just escalated the problem. What is genius about this is that there was no buddy coming at them with an attitude. You're speaking. Do you realize? Ah, how many times have I told you? And uh, I, you know, it's, it's so. And the person self corrects. Self corrects. And so, in this program, that's what I'm teaching you to do: is how to deal with the behavior in the moment, attitudinally, by not having an attitude, but having a skill and a few words to intercede to give them an option toward a new direction. So when we talk consequences, consequences doesn't have to be punitive. It can be natural. It's like, okay, we can go this road and that's going to guarantee everything's going to get ugly or we can go this way with this situation and everything's going to get better. So you get to decide. Okay, that's what they mean by consequences. So you can speed through a school zone and risk killing someone or now that you realize you're speeding, you can slow down and save lives. So I want you to look at consequences a little differently than maybe what you have been doing. And then a fourth is what action, okay? So what can we do differently? next time. Let's practice that. Let's role play that. So all of that is included in this course.